Presenting well can be a fast track to credibility, allowing you to overcome stereotypes and to be seen as a valuable resource. This session is a practice session for a webinar that I'm going to be doing for Twin Cities Society of Human Resource Management. I'm Diane Windingland, and I'm the author of several books on communication skills, and I work with organizations and individuals to help them have better, more profitable presentations to help subject matter experts create presentations that engage and get results. Let's jump in to today's presentation. This is me at age three. Big smile, big teeth, bad hair. Fortunately, some things do change, and it was when I was three years old that I discovered the power of words. My mother had brought me to work to meet her boss and co-workers, and one look at her boss, and I was in awe. She was perhaps the ugliest woman I have ever seen. Long pointy chin, hooked nose, bushy eyebrows over beady eyes. I stared at her, and then I turned to my mother. Mom, she looks just like the Wicked Witch of the West. Complete silence. Wow, I had made quite the impression. And then my mother turned to me, pleading. Diane, don't you mean like Glenda the Good Witch? Was my mother crazy? No, Glenda was pretty. Fortunately, the boss lady laughed, and all was well. And I had a new power, the power of words. But over time, that power diminished from the crisis of confidence that comes with the teen years to being an engineer and being more concerned with my abilities to calculate than my abilities to communicate. And finally, as a stay-at-home mom, where I felt like I completely lost my voice. I was somebody else's wife, somebody's mother. However, over time, I regained my confidence. I found the power of words, primarily through my involvement in Toastmasters through the encouragement of friends and through small successes, I found the power of words. I'm now an author on communication skills, a professional speaker, and a presentation coach and trainer. As a human resource professional, you may feel that you have lost some of your power due to stereotypes. Have you ever felt that people thought you were a paper pusher? the bearer of bad news, or the enemy? In this session, you are going to learn the top ways to earn your seat at the table, to feel confident, credible, be valued, and be seen as a friend. Today, you will discover six power tips to speaking confident and with credibility. The first is to structure with prep. The second, create catchy openings and closings. Third, to engage and motivate with stories. Fourth, to make data meaningful. Fifth, to power up your PowerPoint. And sixth, to deliver with confidence. Power tip number one, structure with prep. When you're asked a question, do you ever ramble, give too much detail, answer too curtly, feel tongue-tied, or feel stupid? If that's the case, I'm going to give you a tip that I got from the book Speaking Up, Surviving Executive Presentations. Using the PREP structure, which, which is an acronym for Position, Reason, Evidence, and Position, where you simply formulate your answer in four stages. 
State your position, the one main idea. Give a reason for your position. Provide some evidence, which could be an example or a story. And then finally, restate your position. Here's a prep example. This is a picture of my husband and me on the first day of a European cruise this fall. My position is that taking a cruise is a great vacation option. My reason, you can see many places with less hassle, more convenience, more relaxation, and more luxury, often at less cost. For example, my husband and I recently took a 22-day, 18-port cruise this fall. There was no figuring out the travel between places, no switching lodging or lugging bags. We had great food all the time, plus as much activities and entertainment as we desired. Compare that with our friends who also recently took a two-week European vacation. They had to take several flights, trains, buses, lost luggage, schlepped luggage around, packed and unpacked multiple times, sometimes had sketchy food options, but I guess that might even have its own particular charms. So, use PrEP to answer questions with clarity and credibility. Position, reason, evidence, and restate your position. Power tip number two. Create catchy openings and closings. Openings, introductions, and closings, conclusions, are often the most memorable parts of a presentation. The first impression and the lasting impression. They're your opportunities to hook your audience, reel them in, and leave them wanting to take action. You can use the three P's formula. Let's try this again. The first P is PEP, get their attention. There's a lot of ways you can get attention from asking questions to stating a startling statistic to telling stories. You can then, after you've gotten their attention, give them a promise. State a benefit that they will receive from listening to the rest of your presentation. This would be the audience why, why it's important to them. Path, preview your points so that your audience knows what to expect. Adult learners like to know what to expect. As an example, for this presentation, the pep was the story about my mom bringing me to work. That's what I used to get attention, a story. Then the promise was that in this session you would discover the top ways to earn your seat at the table and communicate in a way that is confident, credible, and valued. Then there was the path, and that was simply the agenda slide with the six power tips. So use pep, promise, and path to get started in your presentation in an engaging and organized way. You can end with the three P's in reverse, where you summarize the points, then revisit the benefit, and make a call to action. Power tip number three, engage and motivate with stories. When I was a little girl, I loved to tell stories. And, well, let's just say I like to lie a lot by telling stories, and it infuriated my mother that I wouldn't tell the truth. She tried to teach me that it was important to tell the truth, but nothing really stuck until she told me the story of the boy who cried wolf. And it was that story that made me really consider the ramifications of lying, especially when I wanted people to believe me when I told the truth. Let's look at some reasons why stories are powerful. But first, a pop quiz. Remember those in high school? I hated them. The teacher would ask me a question and my mind would go blank. And I'd have 30 pair of eyeballs staring at me, some with relief that they weren't asked a question, but many with superiority because they knew the answer and I didn't. 
Well, these questions are not going to cause you to pass or fail a test, so don't worry about that. We'll have three questions, one on history, one on math, and one on literature. Here is the history question. Can you tell me who, without looking it up, is the 14th President of the United States? Probably not. It was Franklin Pierce. Utterly forgettable. You probably learned it at one time in history, though. Let's move on to a math question. This is pi. Again, without looking it up, can you tell me the value of pi to five decimal places? Maybe? Probably not? Well, here it is. 3.14159. And when I was an engineer, I didn't even have this memorized. I just had it down to 3.14 or use the pi key on my calculator. Well, let's move into literature. The literature question. In the story of the three little pigs, what were their houses made of? If you recall that they were made of straw or hay, sticks and bricks, you're right. Why do you remember that information? It was something you probably learned when you were in preschool. You remember it because it was a story. Stories have many benefits. The first is that they're concrete. People can visualize them like a movie. It's harder to visualize abstract ideas or numbers. Then stories put facts into an emotional context. Emotions and memory are closely connected. Now, you might think stories are kid stuff, but they're critical in business, too. In 2006, Blake McCoskey was traveling to Argentina and noticed that many children did not have shoes. And without shoes, they couldn't go to school and were at risk for disease. He decided to do something and started Tom's Shoes, a one-for-one -one program. For every pair of shoes a customer bought, he would donate a pair of shoes to a child in need. He returned to Argentina the next year with 10,000 pairs of shoes and to date has given away more than a million pair of shoes. Actually, I think it's much more than that. He wasn't the hero. He made his customers the hero. It was their small actions that made the difference or about 86 million differences, which is the actual number of shoes, pairs of shoes that have been given away to date. As he has said, people don't just buy our shoes, they tell our story. The thing to remember is that facts tell, but stories sell. Whether you're selling a product, a service, or your idea. How can you discover your stories? Ask yourself these questions. Who thanks you the most? There's a story there. Who had a really hard challenge that you helped with? Another story. Do you have a great solution? There's a story there too. A little bit on storytelling basics. There's a shape of most stories where you have the setup, you have to give a little bit of context, the who, when, where, what is, what is the current situation. Then there has to be a challenge or conflict. Without a challenge or conflict, a story is boring. Then there's rising actions. First this happens, then that happens. At some point, you get to the turning point in the story where everything changes. Then there's falling action, and finally the resolution. You get to what changed from the beginning or what could be. In a happy story, of course, the resolution or what could be is a positive resolution, which is what you would want to tell for most business stories. So in my opening story, here's how that would plot out on this chart. The first part was my mother bringing 
my three-year-old self to work. That's the who, what, where. Then the point where there was a conflict was when I said that my mother's boss looked like a witch, which created an emotional conflict for my mother. There was rising action when my mother pleaded, didn't I mean like Glenda, the good witch? And the turning point was when the boss laughed and all was well. And I had a newfound power, the power of words. You can inspire change with business stories. So if you have a current state that you want to bring to another better state, that is your what is in your story. The transform state is what could be. Now, the trick here is that think of your client as the person or, you know, someone in upper management or other employees as the main character in the story. You are not the hero. You are not the main character. It's all about them. So what about you? You are the guide on the side. You are going to make others the heroes in your stories. So make others the heroes in your stories and tell stories that show a change. Power tip number four, make data meaningful. Take a look at this chart of chart suggestions. How does that make you feel? Do you feel intrigued? overwhelmed? If I were to guesstimate for a general population, I would guess that about 22% would feel mostly intrigued, but the other 78% would be overwhelmed. In this section on data visualization, there are four learning objectives. Assumptions. We're going to uncover a couple of assumptions. We'll discover a few benefits, investigate a few problems, and touch on selecting a chart that you might use. Assumption number one, style trumps substance, or it's more about the sizzle than the steak, or how you say something is more important than what you say. Now, you may have heard that communication is 93% nonverbal. That would support the assumption that it's more about how you say something than what you say. You may have even seen a chart like this, where 55% of communication is body language, 38% is tone of voice, and only 7% is words. Do you think that's true? Of course not. Well, you are getting some visuals right now. If I were to use visuals and tone of voice alone and not use actual words, I don't think you'd get the message. Let's try a visual and tone of voice, but no words, and see if you get 93% of the message. Okay. Did you get that? Tone of voice and a visual? Okay, so let me try it with words. President Abraham Lincoln was one of the most famous orators in United States history. As we look at firsthand accounts of Lincoln's speeches, he had been described as awkward, squeaking, and unpleasant. However, he held his audiences in rapt attention. What you say, substance, is important. Assumption number two, data is dull. Okay, for most people, raw data is dull. Data without context means nothing. Telling a story with your data is what gives it meaning. Cognitive psychologist Jerome Bruner says that a fact wrapped in story is 22 times more memorable than the mere pronouncement of that fact. 
If you can tell a story with your data, you and your audience can benefit in many ways. You can have increased credibility because including specific details increases your credibility. Which of the following two sentences makes you feel that I'm more credible as an, audit, as an authority? Sentence number one, lots of people will get cancer. Sentence number two, 38.4% of people will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetimes. My guess is that I sounded more credible with sentence number two, with the specific statistic. Another benefit of evidence inclusion is sustained attitude change. Research has shown that inclusion of evidence is likely to increase sustained attitude change. So if you want to persuade your audience and keep them persuaded, include strong evidence. Informed decisions, informed decision making. Emotions are highly influential in decisions and data presented in a meaningful way can influence the emotions. Here's an example. Let's see. Let me go back to the example. Oh, I am missing something here. This is why I practice this. Maybe my example will come up later. There are some problems presenting data. You might have so much data that you feel overwhelmed. Or you might have so much data that you simply dump it on your audience. So who wants to do a data dump on the audience? You know, you don't have to present everything as long as you have the documentation to give details later. Another challenge is that the audience is not knowledgeable in the meaning, methods, or importance of the data. Here's a solution. Harness your inner child and ask questions. Three questions you can ask, three focus questions. What do you want to say? What does the data say? And the audience analysis question, what does the audience need to hear? Then consider how to visualize the data. Here is that a slide on the sentence I said earlier on the lifetime risk of cancer, that 38.4% of people will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetimes. Let's say that the audience is a group of new parents, of newborns, and, and let's ask the three questions. What do you want to say? Well, what I want to say is this. The lifetime risk of cancer is significant. What does the data say? The data is clear. 38.4% of people will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetimes. Now, we could round that to almost 40% or nearly two out of five people will have a significant risk of developing cancer. What does the audience need to hear? This audience needs to hear that their child is at significant risk of developing cancer, which impacts their hopes and dreams for their child. Given that, I could probably create a way of presenting that data that will be concrete and emotional at the same time. And this is what I could use. This image probably would have a greater impact than any graph that I could provide. But you do have to ask yourself a question, would a chart help? Here's an example of the number of U.S. households with cats. Let's say I wanted to just focus on cats. I suppose I could highlight the data in the table 
but perhaps there is another way of doing it. I could use a column chart showing households with cats and households with no cats. But if I really wanted to focus on households with cats, this really looks like I'm focusing on just the opposite, households with no cats. In this case, where I only have one data point, a picture and text might be the simplest way to represent it. 38% of U.S. households have a cat. Now, remember this chart of chart suggestions? There are really only four different types of charts that you can see here. There are charts that show relationship, some that compare data, some that show the distribution of data, and others that show the composition of data. In this particular session, we're only going to look at the three most common types for comparison and composition. We'll use the column chart, the line chart, and the pie chart. For this data, which chart would you use? Would you use a column chart, a pie chart, a line chart, or something else? So pick one of those charts that you would use to show all of this data. Which one do you think would be the best one? Well, I did that. I tried a few different ways to represent this data, which is pretty easy to do in PowerPoint. First, I did a pie chart. Now, for this data, there are a few different problems. First of all, the categories are not discrete parts of a whole. They overlap. Some people that own cats also own dogs. Another problem, and this is true of pretty much all pie charts, is that it's hard to estimate the sizes of circular segments. Now, adding percentages next to the titles might help, but it also will make it more cluttered. Then, after the pie chart, I tried a line chart. This just looks wrong, doesn't it? And the reason why it looks wrong to most people is that a line chart typically shows trends, not categories like this. Then I tried a column chart, and, and this was definitely better because I could see more clearly the categories and the relative sizes. However, I thought, I don't really like my titles at an angle, and that's what PowerPoint did because the titles were too long to put horizontal. So then I decided a bar chart might be the way to go. It's easier to read the different titles. And as long as you're going to try different things, I then took out the grids and added the data points. So if somebody wanted the specific numbers, they'd have the specific numbers. But maybe you could try a different chart. And I decided to try a tree map. And this is what the tree map looked like. This is actually pretty easy to judge the relative sizes in rectangles versus the sizes in a pie chart. And then I decided to take it one step further and add little icons of the different types of animals. So at a glance, you know this is about pets, and you get the relative distribution of households that own pets. Now, if I take a different set of data that is related, and that is the number of pets owned in the United States by type of animal, you can see that people who own freshwater fish typically would own a lot of fish if you had the other chart in mind. If I wanted to talk about freshwater fish as pets, this might be the better data set to use. When you're creating charts, there are a lot of things you need to consider about how it's displayed. But one I'll mention now is color considerations. You'll want to check how your chart prints out in grayscale, because some people might print it out. You'll also want to check how it would be for 
people who are colorblind, which is not an insignificant number of people as 7 to 10 percent of men are colorblind. I used a colorblindness simulator, which you can easily find online, and this was the green blind version. And some of the colors are very similar, however, because they are in discrete rectangular segments and with pictures of animals, it's still a pretty easy chart to understand. You can also look at infographics for ideas in ways to clearly and engagingly present your data, like this one on the minimum ice thickness guidelines for new clear ice. This is a great way to present this particular data. Moving on to power tip number five, power up your PowerPoint. You don't want to have another boring PowerPoint presentation. You don't want to put your audience to sleep. So don't start with the boring agenda slide as your first slide. Remember the three P's. Have the pep and promise first. That said, this is the agenda for this section. We'll talk a little bit about planning your presentation, three easy design principles, and making information visual. Failing to plan is planning to fail. You want to start with why. Why does your audience care? I believe that presentations need to be audience focused and if you don't know why your audience cares then you really shouldn't be giving the presentation. After you know why then plan your presentation. Now you can plan on paper, a whiteboard, brainstorming software, post-it notes, but don't start in PowerPoint because then <clears throat> you might just lose the forest for the trees or you might get so attached to a particular visual even if it doesn't fit. What I like to do, and, and this is actually step two of what I like to do, I like to first of all just sketch out an idea on a piece of paper with general categories and then I'll grab some post-it notes and start writing ideas within those categories and then I'll organize those ideas within the categories on a door in my office. And sometimes I end up throwing stuff away, adding things on, but I've only committed to it on paper. This was the plan for a longer presentation just on using PowerPoint. Design. Don't worry too much about design. I believe that simple is almost always best. Here are three easy design principles to consider for your next PowerPoint presentation. Go big, the rule of thirds, and less is more. Start with go big. Now, this is a typical PowerPoint template with a title and an image in the middle. What if you simply made the image take up the whole slide? Like this. Doesn't that have greater impact? Depending on the image, you might even have your word come in as part of the image. <clears throat> Moving on, rule of thirds. Again, typical PowerPoint template. Well, we just made it bigger, but we did something else too. We changed the crop. If you look here, it was centered, and now it's kind of off to the side a little bit. There's a concept in photography called the rule of thirds, that for an intriguing composition, you can divide the rectangular space into thirds with putting your horizon instead of at the middle at the one third point or two thirds from the top of the page and putting your subject not always in the middle, but off to one side, like at one third or two thirds. The places where the one-third grids intersect are the PowerPoint of your PowerPoints. <clears throat> now, you do not need to have a grid on your PowerPoint. You can eyeball it. You can also do the same with people. This is a picture of one of my sons a couple of years ago when I think we were near Duluth. 
And as you can see, I cropped it with the horizon about one third of the way down and the subject about one third of the way in. It made for a more interesting composition. A little bonus tip on picture placement. What does this eye tracking study tell you? This eye tracking study has two pages and where people look the most is shown in red, second most yellow, and uh, third most is green. On the left hand side, where are people looking? At the baby's face, that's right. On the right hand image, again, they look at the baby's face, but then they look at where the baby's gaze is directing them. So keep that in mind as to how you place your subjects. Here's an example, beautiful woman, quote. Well, she's looking off of the PowerPoint, so it looks kind of odd. Well, a quick fix is just move her over so that her eyes are looking at the quote. But your eyes look at her face first and then they jump back to the left to read the quote. So perhaps keep her on the left, flip the picture so that her eyes are now going the other direction and looking into the quote. This way, we look at her face, her eyes are directing us to the right, and then we read the quote. Consider how the people are using their eyes in your picture and where you place them. Less is more. What's the number one problem when it comes to most PowerPoint presentations? That's right, too much information. Did you even notice the word significance on the slide? Significance was lost because of all the information. Try to have only one idea per slide. Maybe you've heard of the 6x6 six six rule. This is the 6x6 six six rule. No more than 6 bullets per slide. No more than 6 words per bullet. Don't wrap points past one line. Fade in bullets one at a time. This rule is better than wall of text, but it's boring, maybe too much information. Do you really like it? Would you want to see every single slide be bullet points? No. Instead, make information visual. Earlier in the presentation, I talked about the three Ps. This slide was my original slide where I was just going to have the three P's with bullet points. And then I thought, well, that is kind of boring. How could I present this differently? I went to Smart Art, and instead I showed the process with images and then the words, get attention, promise, and path. This is a little more interesting than the bullet points and definitely more memorable. Here's another before slide, weekly food consumption. And really I wanted to emphasize the difference in amount of money. So what I could do is simply have the difference in amount of money and not have all the other information. Option number two, I could try a chart. However, in this case, it's a little ridiculous because the difference is so large. Or, I'm sure you've heard it said, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is the family in the US and their weekly food consumption, a family of four. Wow, looks like they've got definitely teenagers. Now let's look at the family from Chad, a family of six. And that's their weekly food consumption. So, I've just thrown out these ideas to you. Power up your PowerPoint by using these three simple ideas. Go big for some of your slides. Consider using the rule of thirds if you're doing images. And probably the most important one, less is more. Don't have another boring PowerPoint presentation. Power tip number six. 
deliver with confidence. Here are the keys to confidence. Know your audience, know their pain points. Speak from an outline using keywords, not an entire written out document. Practice and rehearse with spaced repetition. Have a checklist and backup plans. Practice some shorter versions, one, two, and five minute versions. Create a confident attitude. The first one, know your audience. How can you get to know your audience? If you really don't know your audience that well, you can schedule some informational interviews. You can look at profiles on LinkedIn. You can do online research depending on what the topic is. You might consider surveying your audience or you might have some other ideas. But know your audience so that you can understand their why and their pain points. Then speak from an outline. You want to internalize your message, not memorize. Use keywords, and if you have specific data and quotes, you probably want to include those on the outline. Remember, people don't know what you're going to say, so if you say things a little differently, that's fine. However, you don't want to mess up specific data or specific quotes. Use pictures and symbols. You can use pictures and symbols as a shortcut message to your brain. Not everything has to be written in words. Critical. Talk to people, not to paper. When you are using notes, if you're looking down at your notes, your mouth should not be moving. The process would be look down at your notes, don't talk, look up, then speak, and then just repeat that process. As long as you're not talking while you're looking at your notes, people will think you have very minimal use of notes. Here's an example of using keywords to aid internalization. Now, this is what I often use as an intermediate step before reducing it even more to an outline. This is an example from the beginning of a speech. So the first line, I look at it and then I say the idea behind it. From the beginning of time, women have performed a task crucial to the survival of humanity, grocery shopping. Now I could have added grocery shopping there, but I knew that was the topic, so I didn't need to. Now I'll go on to the second line. Men may have been the hunters, but women were the gatherers. Next line. And today, women are still the primary grocery shoppers in the family. I think grocery shopping is a sex-linked genetic trait. Next line. My mother loved to go grocery shopping and would spend hours clipping coupons and shopping different stores for the best deals. My daughter's main reason for wanting a driver's license was so that she could go to Target and go shopping. The kid wanted to go every time we ran out of milk. So that's just an example where I had a fully written out speech and then I cut it down to keywords and then I probably would cut it down even more for an outline version. Practice and rehearse. They are different. A practice is personal. This is something you would do by yourself. A practice can be in bits and pieces. You can practice just the introduction as you're driving to the grocery store. Or you can practice telling the story while you're doing dishes. Practice is also something that you would space out over time, ideally spaced repetition. But then rehearsal. Rehearsal is with an audience. It is something, if you've ever been in theater, that's what a dress rehearsal was, where you'd actually practice with an audience, so it was like a real situation. An audience can be just one person. One other person can listen to you go through your whole presentation, because a rehearsal is a complete run-through, as close to the real situation and circumstances as you can make. It should also be shortly before the event, 
preferably two or three days before is when you would have a rehearsal. You also want to have a checklist and a backup. And this is just an example of some things that I have on my own personal checklist. You can practice shorter versions because you never know when your talk might actually get cut short. They've run out of time. So have a one minute version where you basically do prep. Stick with one point and then the next step. Point, um, reason, evidence, and point, next step. If you've got two minutes, you can do prep, you can expand your example, and give a next step. Five minutes, you could have up to three points. You could open with the three Ps, have a regular introduction. You can do prep for each point, prep point one, prep point two, prep point three, and next steps. So have those shorter versions in case your time gets cut. Finally, create a confident attitude. Fake it. Do it not until you make it, but until you become it. Amy Cuddy said this during her well-known TED Talk on body language. She talked about how people held their bodies would have them feel either more powerful or less powerful, where a powerful stance would be an expansive stance, maybe hands on your hips or hands upraised. And a low power stance would be one that's kind of closed in on itself. Maybe you're, you're touching your face or neck. Your two minute life hack, as she says, is to have a powerful stance right before you need to give an important presentation or have an important interview. What I've often done right before a presentation is hop into the restroom and do a power pose in, in the stall. Maybe just the one with my hands on my hips because putting hands above the head might look odd if someone else walks in the restroom. Now on top of this, if there's nobody in the restroom, I will actually do this out loud. But usually I just do it in my head where I have positive phrases that I say over and over for that two minutes. Now yours might be different than mine, but mine are, I am smart, I am powerful, I can make a difference. I am smart, I am powerful, I can make a difference. When I co combine that with having a powerful posture for two minutes, I'm ready to take on the world when I give my presentation. The other thing you want to do is to have the attitude that it's not about you, but it's about your audience and give your audience a gift. Think about how what you are talking about will help them. Because remember, your audience should address their why, their pain points. You're going to help make things better for them or give them a different perspective, which is a gift. The keys to confidence. Know your audience, the pain points especially. Speak from an outline using keywords. Practice and rehearse and space it out because your memory will be enhanced. Have a checklist and backup plans. Practice shorter versions in case it gets cut short and create a confident attitude because you are smart, you are powerful, and you can make a difference. Now, I had said that I was going to end with a three P's in reverse. Path, summarize the points. Promise, revisit the benefits. And pep, call to action. So let's go to the path. So my points are, this is why I need to practice this some more, to structure with prep, to sound clear and credible to create catchy openings and closings, to get them engaged and get people wanting to take action, to engage and motivate with stories, to stick in people's memories and touch their emotions, to make data meaningful so people can take action on it, to power up your PowerPoint, don't put people to sleep, and to deliver with confidence. The promise. When you start to apply the tips, you will earn your seat at the table. You will be seen as confident, credible, valued, 
and a friend. Call to action. Do one to three of the skills that we just talked about today. Reflect on how it went. Consider using outside resources and then adjust. Here's some suggested resources for you. Some online courses. If you go to my website, you can find online courses. I have a free course and one that has a low fee. Lynda.com, if you have access and you're interested, there's several courses. One I found particularly useful was picking the right chart for your data. And books. I have a book available on Amazon, Cat Got Your Tongue. Presentation Zen is very helpful in having beautiful presentations. Storytelling with data, great tips on how to use data to make it meaningful. And then I mentioned earlier, speaking up, surviving executive presentations. Finally, Toastmasters. Toastmasters is a worldwide organization of clubs where people with peers will give speeches and take on leadership roles to develop communication and leadership skills. Very invaluable to actually practice in a low risk environment presentation skills so that when it comes to the important critical presentations, you are ready. Thank you and speak with confidence and credibility.